Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming through this evening to listen to our presentation. This evening, I'll be presenting alongside my supervisor, Associate Professor Dina Pillay, fellow master's student, Olivia Murgatroyd, and myself, Kelly Gilmore. So we'll be presenting today on some of the research we're doing within Sunflay Estuary. The work we're doing falls under a really exciting category of science, which is looking at natural solutions to water quality issues, especially pollution. And when we combine natural solutions with our own human engineered solutions, we can come up with some really sustainable, cost-effective, long-term ways of ecosystem-based management, um, which can really benefit urban environments like Sunflay Estuary. So before we get into all of that, we're just gonna introduce ourselves as people to you first. So next up is my supervisor. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for coming. I know it's a Friday night, so I'm very excited to see the turnout. Uh, it's exceptionally nerve wracking for me being here, not because there's so many people, but because there's so many of my students and ex students in there. And uh, I, I know they're going to be very critical of me because I was critical of them at some point. Uh, and judging from the, from the, uh, cost evaluations at the end of the year. I know how students can be. So guys, just be gentle, okay? This is a learning experience for all of us, okay? So um, I'm the supervisor of Kelly and, and Olivia. Um, and I thought I'll say a little bit about myself and what I do. Um, so I'm employed at UCT. Uh, I was fort fortunate enough to join UCT as a slightly younger man in uh, 2008. And you can see me there on the on the far left hand corner. Um, so I was fortunate, fortunate enough um, two or three years after my PhD to, to kind of land a, a great job in Cape Town. Um, and I really enjoyed being in Cape Town. Everything is fantastic. The people are great. The, the scenery is spectacular, but I really hope Cape Townians do something about the the water temperature, you know, coming from <laughs> from Natal, it really, really, uh, yeah, it was difficult for me. <clears throat> so I remember being very excited, running into the water, trying to embrace the, the Atlantic Ocean, and then jumping out there very, very quickly. It was a bit of a shock to the system. Anyway, so I joined UCT in 2008, and uh, I was fort fortunate enough to progress to the rank of uh, associate professor. Um, and currently I work as a marine scientist focusing on estuarine and coastal ecology. <clears throat> um, but I'm going to take you back to the beginning just to set the scene of how I got involved in, in marine science, hopefully to kind of inspire other people to, you know, to, to get involved in marine science. I came from, from Natal, Durban in, in particular, and, and this is a common scene uh, in Durban, uh, especially during winter. And, uh, you know, this is how I spent most of my time with my, with my father as a, as a young man, fishing on the shores of Durban's beaches. Um, and, and most of the holidays, especially the winter holidays, I spent fishing with my dad. The problem was that I was a terrible fisherman. And uh, I also got bored very quickly with, with fishing. Uh, but it was good fun to spend some time with, with my dad and, you know, learn about the coastal environment. And that's what really got me interested in the coast. And I remember very clearly, uh, you know, what people describe as the greatest shoal on earth. And that's the, the annual sardine run that was part and parcel of Durban's history. So during, during winter, you know, this is a, a, a big spectacle and one that I remember very fondly. Um, so these are the memories that I, that I have and have retained and have kind of inspired me to be involved in marine ecology. Um, but like I said, I was never really a great fisherman. And the, the wonderful thing about fishing is that you require bait for, for fishing. And I became very good at collecting bait. And through that whole process of getting involved in bait collecting, I got very interested in, in, in invertebrates that live in the sand that, that are not very popular by modern standards. You know, they're kind of creepy, they're kind of crawly. 
uh, slimy sometimes, and, and people really don't know much about the invertebrates um, that live in our marine environments. And I got very interested in these invertebrates, so I spent a lot of time in um, Beechwood and Durban Bay mangroves, um, and, and that really got me thinking about ecosystems very, very broadly. Um, you know, we were spoiled to be in, a, well, I was spoiled to be in a subtropical environment where you had organisms like mole crabs. Uh, here's a mole crab peeking above the sand uh, with the antennae for filter feeding. Uh, these are soldier crabs. And, you know, in Durban Bay, you've got spectacular swarms of, of these soldier crabs going on for several tens of meters. And you can hear them making a hissing sound, rolling balls of sand, you know, absolutely spectacular. And you've also got things like uh, bloodworms down here. All of these organisms were, were utilized as bait at some point. Um, so I was pretty good at collecting bait, but that also triggered my interest in understanding what these animals are doing in the ecosystem. So when I was growing up, there was a, a lot of interest in earthworms on land, you know, and the role they play in on land. And I thought to myself, okay, surely these invertebrates that live in, in marine sand should have a similar functional role to play. And that's really what got me interested in, in these kind of invertebrates and inspired me to understand them a little bit more. I was probably about 10 years old at, at that time. Um, and then, you know, as I, as I progressed as a, a master's and a PhD student, I, I got more and more interested in the invertebrates um, because mainly we just didn't understand um, their lifestyle. You know, they live in sand and you, you can't really, you know, open a door and get a peek into what they're doing in the sand. So it's incredibly um, um, frustrating on the one hand, but also incredibly important on the other hand to understand what they're doing in, in ecosystems. Um, through my, my studies, um, I also worked um, at some level in, in consulting in environments. Uh, and through that process, um, I was exposed to coastal ecosystems, mainly in KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, the beauty of these ecosystems, um, you know, we, we were blessed to have these beautiful subtropical ecosystems with mangroves and seagrasses. Uh, but also, um, you know, the, I learned about the stresses that these ecosystems were facing. So stresses like mining, for example, water abstraction, uh, habitat degradation, biodiversity loss really came to the fore uh, in my early days as a postgraduate uh, student. Here we've got a, a really interesting image of the Unschleban estuary in the northern, northern Natal, once described as the most pristine estuary in South Africa. And uh, unfortunately, it's undergone a series of changes that, are, that has changed um, that designation. So, so that inspired me to get involved in understanding how to kind of um, mitigate some of these human impacts and how to restore some of these ecosystems. So through that whole journey of mine, what became apparent is that um, in order to apply knowledge, we need knowledge, right? And uh, one of the major um, observations of mine when I worked in the applied sciences is that the, the, the fundamental scientific knowledge was lacking. And that inspired me to get involved in, in the science of coastal ecosystems and, and really inspired me to kind of get the synergy going between knowledge generation and knowledge application. And, and really, this is, is fundamental to, um, to the Anthropocene. Um, so without this kind of knowledge, um, it's very difficult to manage processes like climate change, improving water quality, uh, understanding biodiversity in our coastal ecosystems, understanding how ecosystems can become more resilient if these components are in these ecosystems. And then finally, to restore ecosystems, we need to know what components need to be in the ecosystem. Um, ultimately, that's where the research is going. 
how do we restore ecosystems to their, their, their former state such that the animals and the plants can do the work they need to do, mitigate against climate change, and improve water quality, for example. Here, um, I'm just showing some examples of how the basic knowledge generation can be used for applied purposes. So this is some work uh, a student of mine from the UK um, is doing. Her name is Katie. Um, so here we, we are trying to restore seagrasses in Langabar and Lagoon. Over the past 50 years, we've, we've detected seagrass loss. Something like 30% of seagrasses in that system has, um, has been lost. Um, and now we're starting to uh, develop a restoration program. So KT uh, has started doing trial transplants to see how these seagrasses can, can take and be restored in the habitat. But the main point I want to make here is that this is a long process. It took us 10 or so years to get to the point where we can apply that knowledge. And, and that's an important point with this type of research. Uh, it takes a long time to generate money, to get the information, and then to apply the knowledge to ecosystem restoration. Uh, Seagrasses are um, rare in the environment. Where do you get them from to restore the environment if they are rare? You know, that's, that's one obvious problem. Anyway, we, 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 we're making progress slowly, but we are getting there. Um, through, through this journey of trying to apply knowledge and generate knowledge, um, there, are, there are several uh, highlights. You know, one highlight is to learn something new about an animal that people did not know about. And the water filtration that we've learned about from the sand prawns that are present in Zanfle is a, is a great example of that. So in theory, these animals should not be filtering water, but they are filtering water. And I'm not going to say too much on that because Kelly and Olivia will say much more, except to say that um, producing scientific knowledge is, is, a, is, a, is an important component of what we do. But also taking that knowledge and, and, and getting it out into, into the public is exceptionally important. And in that hot article down there, you can see um, a news clip from, from UCT News about the sand prawn and its water filtration capabilities. So that's something new we found. It's adding to scientific knowledge, and hopefully we can put that into some type of application in the future. And that's what Olivia and Kelly will talk about. Um, yeah, and, and just to, <laughs> yes. Um, getting, getting the science into the newspapers is a very important uh, role that, that uh, you know, of, of scientists like myself and my students. So Gemma Lewis is a former M MSc student of mine sitting at the back, and she did this amazing work on how COVID lockdowns uh, affect birds in Musenberg Beach. Uh, so she wrote a fantastic article. Uh, she got a distinction for a master's. And then we were contacted by a newspaper in Natal to write this article about what's happening in, in Musenberg Beach. You know, so it's, it's, it's an amazing story of how the, the information is getting out into the public, which is very important. One of the big highlights of being an academic, of course, is that you get to work with the young minds and the future stars of, uh, of tomorrow. And um, here I'm just kind of showing that, you know, I've got in this image two of my uh, latest PhD graduates. And, and for me, it's wonderful to work with young minds uh, and, and to get them to become the next generation of ecosystem managers or ecosystem scientists. And, and it's wonderful to, to work with young minds because they, they've got great ideas. So Gemma came to me with an idea about Musenberg and COVID, and I simply applied my mind to help smooth that project out. Kelly came to me with a project trying to work on Musenberg because, sorry, um, Zanfle, because she lives in Marina da Gama. And Olivia also came to me with a project about persistent pollutants in the environment. And, you know, by putting our heads together, you know, we can generate some new knowledge and try to apply that in the future. So 
I, I'm going to stop here by talking on stars of the future because it brings me quite nicely onto them and their research. So I'm going to hand over to you guys. Hi, sorry. I don't know if it's loud. Um, I'm Olivia. I'm currently one of Dina's master's students at UCT. Um, so I'm originally from Durban and I grew up near the beach. So I've always been very interested in the ocean and marine biology. And last year I moved to Cape Town to do my honors at UCT. And I became very interested in pollution, but specifically pharmaceutical pollution. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kaylee Gilmore, for those who don't know me, and I'm also doing my Marine Biology Masters at UCT. Um, I'm also a member of the Sunclay Trust Committee, a recent member I joined this year in January. And on top of that, I'm a Marina de Gama resident. I was born here in 1999, and I have very fond memories growing up in my home, Sunclay and Marina de Gama. My twin sister and I, we have many, many happy memories spent in the water, on the water, under the water um, with my family. And yeah, I, we've both, I think from a young age, we both developed a sense of um, responsibility for the environment, especially when baby ducklings were calling for our rescue. <laughs> and we heard them from our home. Needless to say, we had quite a menagerie of animals under our care when we grew up. Um, yeah, and I think this has played a, a key role in shaping my journey as a marine biologist and led me to where I am today, trying to contribute to work that's, that's going to benefit my home and yeah, this natural, well, this beautiful environment that we live in. So before we dive into what we're doing in terms of our actual research, it's a good thing to question what, what is a nature-based solution? Um, so the definition I have up there is the sustainable use and management of nature and ecological processes such that socio-environmental issues or challenges can be addressed. And just to kind of say that in a different way, what we're doing is we're trying to look at an ecosystem and understand the processes within it, the species within it, and how those, those processes are playing important roles in the health of that system. So for us to under, understand that, we have to do the research that we're doing. And when we, when we can discover these natural processes that are doing good in the ecosystem, for example, with the water quality issue, as many of you may know, we have had a couple sewage spills over the years. Um, and not only do we need human engineered solutions, of course we do, where sewage infrastructure needs to be repaired and maintained. But there are also processes that we aren't aware of in our ecosystem that are naturally buffering that environment against the consequences or the harm of our actions. So nature-based solutions are a great, sustainable, cost-effective way to add to our human engineered solutions such that we can create ecosystem-based management that is successful and, and forward thinking. Um, and as Dina was saying, we need knowledge, we need an understanding of our environment for this to be possible. So that's where, that's where we come in and that's where our research comes in. We're not solving the issues on our own. We, we're working together. This isn't a, yeah, a one shoe fits all kind of scenario. So just to talk about Zanplay Estuary. Um, it's a highly urbanized um, ecosystem. We know that there's Marina de Gama, there's Lakeside, and there's a lot of people living around the area, which means there is some sort of pollution happening. It's also a model ecosystem, which means that anything we learn in this ecosystem can be used and applied to other ecosystems globally. Um, Zanfle is a very important estuary because it's uh, one of the only um, functional fish nursery on the False Bay Coast, and it's also a very popular uh, recreation destination. So just to talk briefly about my master's research, um, so I'm investigating the effects of a common and persistent pharmaceutical antibiotic on the water filtration ability of sand prawns. 
to do this, I have collected water samples from around Zanfle and I've collected sand prawns and I'm processing them in the lab to find out the concentration. I'm also planning on doing an experiment very soon um, just to get some more knowledge on how everything works in the ecosystem. So just to talk about pharmaceutical pollution and what it is. Um, so when we take medicine, obviously we consume it and it goes to our body, but it doesn't always get absorbed into our body. And often it gets eliminated. Um, a lot of it gets eliminated in the exact same form. And when it goes to wastewater treatment plants, um, unfortunately it doesn't always get removed. This is because wastewater treatment plants um, are not designed to remove pharmaceuticals. From there, it obviously ends up in the environment, in rivers, estuaries, and the ocean. Unfortunately, we also throw our medicine away, or we flush it down the toilet when it's expired, or if we don't use it. From there, it can go to landfills and also end up in the environment. So just to talk about why this is bad. So pharmaceuticals don't always biodegrade. Even though they can dissolve in water and we don't see them, they are still there and they can end up in the sediments and in animals. So they can affect animals' reproduction, behavior, and diversity. A very good example of this is feminization in fish, where artificial female hormones from birth control pills actually uh, accumulate in fish and change their um, characteristics to female characteristics, which really affects diversity. They can also affect human health. Um, because they're not always removed, because they're very small part, uh, molecules, like in uh, wastewater, uh, wastewater treatment plants, um, they're not always removed from our drinking water. So why should we be studying pharmaceutical pollution and why should we be doing this in South Africa? So there's been an increase in pharmaceutical use and consumption, specifically in developing countries um, like South Africa. However, there's very little research done in South Africa. One of the only papers done on pharmaceutical pollution was actually done in False Bay. And in this paper, they found that there was very high or relatively high uh, concentrations of specific pharmaceuticals along the coast, in the water, in the sediments, and in invertebrates like starfish. So I just want to speak about why I'm focusing on sand play and why I'm using sand prawns in my, um, for my master's research. So as we know, sand play comes straight into False Bay. And as I mentioned earlier, sand play is an important estuary along the coast and um, it may be a source of pharmaceuticals. Because we know False Bay has high levels of pharmaceuticals, or relatively high levels, um, it may be coming from the estuaries around the bay or from rivers. So it's important to find the source of the pharmaceuticals and see if our estuaries and other environments are affected. Um, so as Dina mentioned earlier, sand prawns are very important. Um, sand prawns can filter water and mitigate the effects of nutrient pollution, which Kelly will be talking about more, and eutrophication. So onto my master's research. Firstly, for honors, I did do, I did focus on the sand prawn effect and how they filter nutrients um, out of the water column and how their burrows can act as these natural filtration systems. Um, but this year, I'm kind of growing on that. And for my master's, I'm now looking at another species within sunflay and how it may have a role in uh, water quality improvement. So my work is looking at the relationship between salinity, sago pondweed growth, which is just this pondweed, which Marina de Gama residents may be familiar with, um, and how whether this presence of this pondweed improves water quality. And when I say improves water quality, I mean, removes nutrients out of the system. So my work entails me going, getting on my little boat, um, usually with my partner and personal marine uh, engineer, Wade, <laughs> um, who helps me a lot with equipment issues, and I'm very grateful. 
And we usually head around all these sites and we use a, a tool called the CTD, which measures salinity, water temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, those kind of variables at each site. And I've been doing it at surface and bottom water because I'm really curious to see the difference. Um, and then at seven of the 11 sites, we've been collecting water samples and that I take back to UCT to analyze for nutrients, nutrients being nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are the two key nutrients that cause the issue of eutrophication, which I'll explain a bit later. Um, and then I'm hoping to use this winter and summer comparison. I've been doing this during winter and we're going into summer, so I'll be doing it in summer again to kind of create a framework and a baseline for me to perform an experiment where I can actually test the effects of salinity on pondweed and how that influences its ability to absorb nutrients. But I'll explain a little bit more as we go. Firstly, why am I worried about, why are we worried about the water quality in Sunflay? Um, as some of you may know, there is a bit of a sewage problem going on in our environment. But on top of that, we have many other sources of nutrient pollution. So that's, that's my concern, is nutrient pollution in Sunflay. And that comes in the form of sewage, um, as well as fertilizer use. And fertilizers are used throughout the catchment. We've got quite a diverse array of agricultural and vineyard and constantia, all of the, the rivers that flow through, through that area all, all influence Sunflay and feed into Sunflay. So fertilizer use and stormwater runoff, those, those are all sources of nutrient pollution and affect Sunflay estuary. So in this example, we have a nutrient pollution source and it's flowing directly into a stormwater drain. And that stormwater drain happens to be the one leading right into Sunflay. So that's directly nutrients going directly into Sunflay. And this is a problem because fertilizers, which have nutrients, have the same effect on aquatic plants as they do on the crops we, we actually want them to do their job with. It causes increase in growth. And certain species of plant um, and microorganisms love that. So we have this happening, probably also familiar to some Marina de Gama residents. These filamentous algal mats bloom. They grow on the surface and uh, on the sediment and are easily dislodged. And when these mats accumulate, it can be quite problematic. That is a phytoplankton bloom. So that bright green color in the water indicates a microorganism called phytoplankton, which also loves lots of nutrients and will bloom. And what these things have in common is the restriction of light. So with these situations, the sunlight can't reach below the water surface. And when that happens, that means any plant life that's in the water can't photosynthesize. And when it can't photosynthesize, it starts to die. When it starts to die, the bacteria that decompose it use up the remaining oxygen in the water. And then we get into some real trouble. And this is where it gets risky. And an anoxic or lacking of oxygen environment happens. And that's, that's really dangerous because that means all the other organisms in the environment that so depend on oxygen, which is most things, aren't able to survive. So we really we have to try and avoid that from happening because it's very difficult to repair an ecosystem that's reached that point. It should be noted that estuaries like Sunflare are dynamic naturally. They do change. They do shift in state. Sometimes naturally ecosystems are more phytoplankton dominant or algal dominant or pondweed dominant and it does move but the issue that i'm addressing is that with this increase in nutrients these things are becoming more prominent and that's something we need to address so why am i focusing on pondweed um, so there has been research that suggests certain types of pondweed across the world have got a nutrient sink capability and that just means they can absorb nutrients out of the water column. Um, so I'm thinking, well, maybe it happens here too. And my, my thoughts, my hypothesis are that if pondweed is present, it takes away that excess nit nitrogen and phosphorus and prevents or decreases the risk of this happening. And just from being a resident, not necessarily a marine biologist, I don't, I don't think I've ever witnessed these things occurring together 
Usually when there's a big amount of pond weed, it can get irritating, but the water's clear. Um, and when this is happening, I mean, I can't see any of that. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm going with my research. Another reason I'm focusing on pond weed is because it is actually a really important species in our environment for other reasons. It's, it's a good food source for aquatic uh, birds, such as these, the geese and the coots, and the coots, we love to see them building their nests with the pond weed, which I haven't seen for a while, but um, pond weed is also a refuge for fish and aquatic invertebrates, all of which form a really important part of the intricate food webs that exist in Sunflay. As with most things in life, too much of one thing is usually not good. So when pond weed has this historically like bloomed and gone a bit crazy, it's been managed using a weed harvester. And this is necessary because we are, as Olivia mentioned, this is a place of recreation. We've got sailing, windsurfing, canoeing, a lot of stakeholders involved, you know, wanting different things out of the environment. So historically it has been managed using a weed harvester uh, just to keep that the population itself in a healthy in a healthy like size, um, because also if it were if it does bloom excessively, it has the same kind of effect knock on effect on itself where it uses up all the nutrients and blocks the light. So it's a it's a bit of a a balance, a bit of a threshold that we need to maintain with that. So masters is quite complicated. There's just one more element that I'm looking at, which is quite important. Salinity. I'm, a big part of my, my work is trying to work out whether there's a relationship between higher salinity and the recent decline that we've witnessed in pondweed. So the decline is more anecdotal and also for me as a resident, I, I can see it hasn't been as prominent as it used to be. Um, and the, the rise in salinity is because in, I think it was 2014, the rubble weir was lowered at the mouth and this has facilitated more uh, tidal flushing of the system, which has had many benefits, fish recruitment, uh, spring tides, you can see that water coming in and it's beautiful. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to maybe, well, I'm trying to explore whether this, this increase in salinity has got a direct effect on the decline in pondweed because perhaps it's not tolerant to the new levels of salinity. And then what? So, if it's not tolerant, say it doesn't like the high salinity, what then? So then mouth management plan, the, the mouth management plan should consider this. It's gotta be part of the process of working out how we manage the mouth. If a key species in our environment isn't liking it, you know, it's gotta be acknowledged and processed in whatever way that happens. Or a species that's more tolerant of high salinity, almost like the functional cousin of the pond weed that exists, the current pondweed that I'm looking at is called Stichenia um, pectinata, and its cousin that I'm referring to is Rupia serosa. So this is, just, this is just a suggestion. It would require a lot of research, um, a lot of questions needing to be answered, but it is an option to consider that maybe a species that does the, provides the food and the refuge um, and the nutrient absorption, but likes higher salinities, maybe that species is something we need to be exploring. So what can you do? <laughs> We've spoken a lot about what we're doing. Um, as a Marina de Gama resident, best not to remove the baby pond weed that's sprouting. Um, I'm trying to study it. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you are going to remove these icky uh, algal mats, the best thing to do is to, to remove them, but to put them, if you can, not big mounds on your jetty or on the water's edge, because what happens is as they dry, the nutrients leach straight back into the water and it actually it doesn't really benefit as much as it could if you were to completely remove it. It is quite difficult though, because it is heavy and it is gross, but that's my recommendation. Um, secondly, Use less fertilizer. If you have to use it, use the correct amount. But also we live in Cape Town, most of us, and indigenous gardens are great and we should all be considering that as an alternative in our gardens. Um, and they don't need fertilizer. You don't need fertilizer for succulents and fanboss. They love that sandy, uh, white sand. They're happy in that. So use less fertilizer and 
even if you can, don't use fertilizer. And that's also not even if you're just a Marina de Gama resident. As I said, people who live anywhere in the San Fe catchment, all the way up to Constantia, if you have gardens, it, it all it does connect. And if you're using a lot of fertilizer and it leaches down into the groundwater, that lands up in the river and that lands up in San, in San Fe. So bear in mind, we, are all, we all have a role to play. Yeah, so uh, during load shedding, it's also important to maybe not use the bathroom or if you have to, just not flush the toilet as much. This takes a lot of pressure off the pump, uh, pump stations while the power is off and prevents them from overflowing, which could potentially cause nutrient pollution and pharmaceutical pollution that we both spoke about. Um, so also what to do with your medicine. You should think about discarding your medicine correctly. Instead of throwing them in the bin or throwing them down the toilet, um, maybe you could, you could probably take them to a chemist or a pharmacy. They, they often take expired medicines um, and dispose of them correctly. Thank you. Um, and lastly, and importantly, if you, are, if you do see a sewage spill, best thing to do is report it as quickly as possible. I know there are, uh, the residents in Marina de Goma are quite good with this but there's an emergency number. There's also, if you have a resident association or WhatsApp group that can get hold of the manager of Sunfle or the, reticul the reticulation manager, um, often they have those contact details. There's also a city website. You're welcome to take a photo if anyone wants, otherwise come later and ask. Um, yeah, so if we report it quicker, then the city can act quicker. So good logic. It's you. Oh. <laughs> I think I'm okay. Yeah, I thought Kelly was doing such a great job that she could finish off. But um, yeah, so yeah, the, you know, the guys did a fantastic job to summarize what they've done and and how we all can can kind of contribute to um, you know improving the the nutrient pollution uh, situation. Uh, and then lastly, we thought we could leave with some take home messages. You know, what are the main themes we would like to emphasize at the end of this presentation? Uh, and the one thing is um, the point that Kelly touched on, and that is the need to integrate uh, natural solutions with engineering solutions. You know, those have to go hand in hand um, for these e ecosystems to become more resilient and, and resist whether it is nutrient pollution or, or global change pressures, um, you know, natural solutions and engineered solutions have to come together. Um, the other important point is that uh, we know a lot about what is affecting our ecosystems, but there are also things that we don't know about. So the, a great example would be Olivia's um, work on uh, pharmaceuticals, you know, the antibiotics that we use, you know, we don't know what's happening to those as they go into the environment. Uh, in the paper that Olivia mentioned, uh, they talked about caffeine being present in some of the animals in false place. So can you, can you imagine these little tiny organisms being filled with caffeine and, and, and just getting super hyped up, you know? <laughs> we, we don't know about what's going on there and what the consequences are. So we need to understand these stresses more. Um, going into the future, there will be more stresses that we, that we cannot contemplate. So part of the research is to develop early warning systems and be at the forefront of understanding change. And then lastly, you know, why all of this is important is really to get uh, to increase ecosystem resilience. Make sure the components that need to be in the ecosystem are there doing the jobs integrating well, because if that happens, then those ecosystems become more resilient. They can take a little bit more stress, you know, kind of uh, resist global change stress, climate change stress, um, some anthropogenic stress. Um, so a regenerated environment is really the goal of what we're trying to do. Uh, we don't have all the solutions. It's a long process. As you can see, we work in an environment where there are several constraints including funding for this type of work. Uh, but I think we're on the right track. I think we've got the right personnel, um, mostly. Yeah. Um, yes, so I think I'm going to stop there and say thanks very much to, the, to Kelly and Olivia, and thanks a lot to, to the audience for coming through.